Welcome, welcome everyone. Beautiful Sabbath day. Okay. Um, I put something together this morning, so I hope uh, this will be food for thought for you. Um, some of the things I'm going to be showing and talking about, I have made, have mentioned in passing um, in regards to choices, right? So we can get that idea of what the depiction of the picture is. We all have choices to make every day, right? And the question I've asked before is, how many choices on average do we make in a day? It's a study done on this. How many choices do we make in a day, on average? Nearly 10,000. Wow. Nearly 10,000 choices we make every day from simple things. Simple things. Every day we face thousands of decisions, both major and minor, from whether to eat that dark chocolate treat to pursue a romantic relationship or to change careers. How does the brain decide? A new study written up by Time Magazine suggests the brain rely, relies on two separate networks to do so. One that determines the overall value and then the risk versus the reward or those individual choices, another part that guides how out ultimate behavior. So it's two choices based upon the cost and the benefit. It's basically how the brain works in regards to making a choice. Now, Jan Glasher, lead author of the study and visiting associate at the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena, referring to the seats of higher level reasoning in the brain, the cognitive control and value-based decision-making task appear to depend on different brain regions within the prefrontal cortex. And we know a little bit about this, don't we? So I put a little diagram up here. And where does God speak to us? In the prefrontal cortex, of course, right? Uh, in vision, Sister White said that she saw Satan and his forehead had been receding because he has no longer a connection with God and he's no longer speaking to him through his prefrontal cortex. So we see the two basic parts of the brain. We're going to talk about this a little bit and get into some depth in regards to the brain and how we're in a battle over what? Our conscience. Ultimately, it's a battle over the conscience and it comes down to the choices we make free will because we're made just a little bit less than the angels in regards to what God wants in his kingdom is people making free will choices to choose and serve him. Here's an interesting little, uh, for those who were out in the world, I was out in the world for many, many years. There was a band called Led Zeppelin um, and they had a very famous song called Stairway to Heaven and in that there was the choice there were two roads you could go down. Now I thought it was very interesting in this particular uh, snippet that I found out the guitarist Jimmy Page and the lyrics were added by Jimmy Page but it was it was strumming this chord that he had set up and it was Robert Plant who had taken a piece of pencil and paper and then suddenly started automatically handwriting. Automatic handwriting. Do we know of anybody else that that's happened to? People were brought into vision and they started writing. Now, I thought it interesting. I put these symbols up here too because these have become very popular, especially the two in the middle uh, within Catholicism, which is at the pagan roots, the sun worship system. Uh, it's the pagan roots of their religion. Ellen White also wrote automatically as well, but she was guided by what? A spirit of the Lord. So just as the other person was guided by another spirit, so Ellen White was guided by a spirit as well. And I've been reading the Testimonies of Church from volume one, and I've been going forward from that, and through these pages of divinely inspired writing statements, uh, somewhat similar or in parallel to the, what happened to Robert Plant, he was receiving from an outside force, she received from God and God's messenger as we know her. And what I'm about to read from volume 1, page 127 and page 128, we're going to see a great manifestation of the Spirit of God through the messenger of the Lord as the message includes not just the pen but also a vision as well. We read from the pen of inspiration. 
At the conference of Battle Creek, May 27th, 1856, I was shown in vision some things that concern the church generally. So that would mean the church overall, correct? The glory and majesty of God were made to pass before me, said the angel. He is terrible in his majesty, yet you realize it not. Terrible in his anger, yet you offend him daily. Strive to enter in at the straight gate, Luke 13, 24. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which that go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it, Matthew 7, 13. These roads are distinct. They're separate in opposite directions. One leads to eternal life, the other to eternal death. I saw the distinction between these roads, also the distinction between the companies traveling them. Now listen carefully. The roads are opposite. One is broad and one is smooth. The other is narrow and rugged. So the parties that travel them are opposite in character, in life, in dress, and in conversation. Those who travel in the narrow way are talking of the joy and happiness they will have at the end of the journey. Their countenance is often sad, yet often beam with holy, sacred joy. They do not dress like the company in the broad road, nor talk like them, nor act like them. A pattern has been given them. A man of sorrows has acquainted with grief, opened that road for them, and they traveled it, and he traveled it himself. His followers see his footsteps and are comforted and cheered. He went through safely, so can they, if they follow in his footsteps. And we read on, in the broad road, all are accompanied with their persons, their dress, and their pleasures in the way. They indulge freely in hilarity and glee, and think not of their journey's end, of the certain destruction at the end of the path. Every day they approach nearer and nearer their destruction, yet they madly rush on faster and faster. Oh, how dreadful this looked to me. I saw many traveling in the broad road who had the words written upon them, dead to the world, the end of all things is at hand, be ye also ready. They looked just like all the vain ones around them, except a, sh a shade of sadness which I noticed upon their countenances. Their conversation was just like that of the gay, thoughtless ones around them, but they would occasionally point with great satisfaction to the letters on their garments calling for the others to have the same upon theirs. They were in the broad way, yet they professed to be one of the number who were traveling in the narrow way. Those around them would say, there is no distinction between us. We are alike. We dress and talk and act alike. I thought these were some sobering words to think about in regards to are we recognized as a different peculiar people an old Cherokee chief teaching his grandson about life. A fight is going on inside me, he said to the boy. It is a terrible fight, and it's between two wolves. One is evil, he is anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, self-doubt, and ego. The other is good. He is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. The same fight is going inside you and inside of every other person too. The grandson then asked his grandfather, which wolf will win? The old chief simply replied, the one you feed. Who are we feeding today in our life choices? Joshua says, choose you this day whom you shall serve. And Elijah told about it too as well. If God be God, serve him. If Baal be Baal, serve him. We read from the Bible. Everything here is from King James. Jeremiah 1, 4 through 9. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go into all that I shall send thee. And whosoever I command thee that thou shalt speak, be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee. Saith the Lord, 
Then the Lord put forth his hands and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. I'd like to take a moment for prayer, if you'd like to kneel with me or bow your heads. Gracious Heavenly Father, I'm a man of unclean lips. I was born in iniquity. In my womb did my mother conceive me this way. But your word says that you have sanctified me also. And Lord, I pray that you would press back any darkness of thought, any darkness of forces that are around us here and around your children today on their holy Sabbath day. And I pray that you pour out your spirit, Lord, that you give us the unction of that spirit that we may understand more fully the solemnity of the time in which we are living and what you are calling your children to do. As we study this, morning, this afternoon, Lord, I pray that you, again, just open our minds with your wisdom, your grace, and your mercy, and give us food from heavenly places, Lord, from the bread of life itself. For we ask these things in your Son's name. Amen. Again, from the word of the Lord, Luke 16, 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And there was a question uh, that was posted recently on a social networking platform that said, what do you think of money? Um, would you consider that mammon, if we knew what mammon is? There's four times in the Bible it talks about in the New Testament. Uh, here in Luke, it, it actually talks about it three times. Here's a painting by uh, George Frederick Watt in 1885 on Mammon, it was called, the title. And the definition that I was able to find and kind of peel back a little bit was material wealth or possessions, especially having a debasing influence. Now, what does that mean to have a debasing influence? Immoral. Anything else? It's trying to usurp its position maybe on you? Ed, you were going to say something? Degrading. Degrading. So why would the Bible warn us between serving God and something that's degrading or immoral? What do you think? It would. Yes, it would. Because there's only two roads you can go down, right? And in the vision, Ellen White talked about that there was some that were in the wide way that had written on their chest that they knew the Lord, they knew he was coming, but they were living in the wide, on the wide path with the rest of them. So I think we just need to be very careful in regards to how we view ourselves in relationship to our walk with the Lord and not so much walk with other people. In the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 21-22, we read, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, then I be single, then the whole body shall be full of light. Who is that light? Who's the light? Christ is the light. Amen? John 8, 12, Then spake Jesus again, saying to them, I am the light of the world. He that follow me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of light, life. Brothers and sisters, was he there in the beginning in the creation? He was. He was the light that came out of the darkness. So where is the great controversy taking place today for each of us? I kind of told you. Rick is pointing his forehead in the frontal lobe. The pre, what is it we called? Prefrontal vortex? Cortex. Not the vortex, but it could be a vortex, depending on what's coming in and out of there, right? It's the doorway into your brain, is it not? And we're going to peel this back a little bit um, and, and understand how important it is to paint the blood on the doorpost of our mind's eye. Because everything that comes in is going to find its way in if we let it 
and it's going to be by beholding you become changed. Mind, character, personality. Either evil angels or the angels of God are controlling the minds of men. It's a black and white controversy today. Our minds are given to the control of God or to the control of the powers of darkness and it will be well for us to inquire where we are standing today, whether under the bloodstained banner of Prince Emmanuel or under the black banner of the power of darkness. How could that be? How could that be? Let this mind of Christ be in you also, right? So if Christ's mind is not in you, it's telling us that somebody else has got control of your mind and that's the prince of darkness in our lives. Pen of inspiration, Isaiah 20, excuse me, uh, the word of God, Isaiah 26, 3. Thou will keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee because he trusteth in thee. Amen? Amen? That's a promise. So if the mind be single and the whole body be full of light, what are we keeping our mind on? Christ, the light of the world. And he says, and I will dwell in you, and this will be an exceeding great and precious promise because you'll be a partaker of my nature. And then nature comes into us and it becomes an outgrowth of who we are in our experiential life as we meet and greet others of other faith within the Protestant denomination, but others on the street who may be possessed. God is a powerful God. We read in Psalm 24, verses 3 and 6, Who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in the holy place? He that, lift, he that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah, forevermore. Isn't that what we want as the two groups that she mentioned in the beginning? We're looking to the future of an internal life with Christ Jesus. And we're on a road. We're in a race, right? Paul talks about it. A race of faith. Desire of Ages, page 331. When we are born from above, the same mind will be in us that was in Jesus. Amen? The mind that led him to humble himself that we might be saved. Then we shall not be seeking the highest place. We shall desire to sit at the feet of Jesus and learn of him. We, will un we shall understand that the value of our work does not consist in making a show and noise in the world and in being active and zealous in our own strength. The value of our work is in the proportion of the impartation of the Holy Spirit. Trust in God brings holier qualities of mind so that in patience we may possess our souls. Those who take Christ at his word and surrender their souls to his keeping, their lives to his ordering, will find peace and quietude. Nothing of the world can make them sad when Jesus makes them glad by his presence. In perfect acquaintance, this is a perfect rest. The Lord says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee because he trusteth in thee. Is that it, where we want to be? It's a tough battle, right? Moment by moment, day by day, right? 10,000 choices. Oh Lord, you don't want to be in the details of my life. Yes, he does. Every hair on our head is numbered. Because every choice we make is going to come from one place or another. I'm going to peel this back a little bit. 1 Timothy 6.12 says, Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on to eternal life, whereunto thou art called, has professed a good profession before many witnesses. Our calling is one of eternal. Blessings are a permission for God to work in our lives because we've made the choice to receive the blessing and he's ready to pour it out. Pen of Inspiration tells us that there are angels waiting at his command. All we have to do is ask. 
Ephesians 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. How much more does he want to give precious gifts to us than we want to our children? Amen? Now there's the curse. This is a permission for Satan to work in your and my life because we've made the choice. And God's got to step back. Now, I'm dealing with a Methodist elder for a long time, last five years, about this idea of predestination. Once saved, always saved. And he's finally getting it through Scripture, through the Word of the Lord. That, wait a minute, I can lose my salvation? Yes, you can, because you can make some bad choices and you can cut yourself off. He's going to pursue you and pursue you, but you make the choice whether you're going to serve him or not. In Galatians 3.13, we read, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So there is a choice. We accept Jesus Christ and the offering he made, his blood, the redeeming blood of Christ, that gave us this ability to get out of jail free. A jail of bondage. The other part that my, my Methodist friend doesn't really understand is that I tell him, Phil, you can live a sinless life today. We all can. Through Christ Jesus. He didn't come into the world to save us in our sin, did he? He came into the world to save us from our sin. This is a promise. This is the life that we've chosen and this is the life that we're going to have to walk with experimentally and extensionally because if we don't live that life, we're going to be left out. I believe that. If we choose not to accept this blessing, manifesting actions of words which reveal either the blessing or the cursing, the Greek and Hebrew translate manifest in the Bible as proving oneself. So, if there's a mind that is of Christ that's in you, it's going to be a blessing and manifest itself. But if it's a mind of the other fallen angels, it's going to manifest itself in another way. There's our strings attached for every decision we make. Do you realize that? Maybe not so, um, how, how do we say it? You know, do I brush my teeth this morning? Hmm. Is that going to be a curse or a blessing? Well, if you get into that idea or that thought of it to do it or not do it every single day, of course, you're going to get rotten teeth after a while. Right? So just the simple things of hygiene. But what about the other things that we do in our lives as well? Just that little sin, remember? Just that little sin. I just, I, I just keep it next to me. And someday I'll get rid of it. And the Lord says, I don't know. You're holding on to it pretty well. And I'm not going to take it away from you unless you give it to me. So we're manifesting these choices we make. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. So the manifestation comes from one spirit or the other, right? Isn't that what the pen told us? Participation. So not as only is it manifesting, we're participating with it as well, allowing spiritual beings to express themselves through you. Example would be your temper is allowing anger to express through you. Helping one in need is allowing love to express itself through you. Remember, when we have Christ in our hearts, it must find expression. Those who put on Christ are going to relate to others. The soul agony, Sister White says. The things that God has provided to us. Here we see a depiction of Christ talking to his disciples. He who confess Christ must have Christ abiding in him. He cannot communicate that which he has not received. The disciples might speak fluently of doctrines. They might repeat the words of Christ himself, but unless they possess Christ-like meekness and love, they were not confessing him. The mission of Christ's servants is a high honor and a sacred trust. What does that word sacred mean? Holy. Holy divine. He that receiveth you, he says, receiveth me. And he that receiveth me, receiveth him that sent me. 
Matthew 10, 4, no act of kindness shown to them in his name will fail to be recognized and rewarded. Now, we don't do this because it's a workspace system and we're going to get ourselves into heaven. This happens because Christ is living his life out through us. Sanctification, the process by which your mind is renewed and become more Christ-like. So we talk about justification, right? That's... That's that you're free from the penalty of sin. Sanctification, you're free from the power of sin. And glorification, you're free from the presence of sin. Acts of the Apostle, page 560. Sanctification is not the work of a moment, an hour, or a day, but of a lifetime. It is not gained by a happy flight or feeling, but it is the result of constantly dying to sin. What do we have to do? Die daily, moment by moment, 10,000 choices. Wrongs cannot be righted nor reformations wrought in the character by feeble, intermittent efforts. It is only by long, persevering effort, sore discipline and stern conflict that we shall overcome. We know not one day how strong will our conflict the next. So long as Satan reigns, he shall have self to, we shall have self to subdue, besetting sins to overcome so long as life shall last. There will be no stopping place, no point which we can reach and say, I have fully attained. Sanctification is the result of lifelong obedience. Obedience to what? You said it earlier, to die to self. What's the greatest battle, Edward? The warfare against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. Amen. Amen. 1 Corinthians 1, 30 and 31. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that gloreth, let him glory in the Lord. Amen. Is that what we want? I don't want to be a sad Ventus. I want to be a happy Ventus. This is, this, is, this is good news, is it not? Iniquity. Mm. Legal culpability for sin. This is not the sin itself, but the legal responsibility for the sin. Example is that the parents are legally responsibility, responsible for the action of the child. The sin rests with the parents. The idea allowed Christ to take up on the iniquity of the world and pay the price for sin. In most cases, when the work of iniquity is used in the Old Testament, the idea behind the word is a legal culpability. That's why it could go on to the third and fourth generation of them that who hate me. And Leviticus 5, 1 says, And if a soul, and hear the voice of swearing, and is a witness, whether he hath seen or known of it, if he do not utter, then he shall bear his iniquity. Can we get by with watching open sin in our presence and not say something? I don't think we can. By our silence, we condone it. Now, yes, we're to do it in a loving manner in regards to how we get people out of sin and help them to overcome. But for us to be silent about it, I think it's, gonna, it's a slippery slope, brothers and sisters. Generational iniquity. The legal right Satan has to work in a person's life because of the actions or decisions of their ancestors. This iniquity is a powerful tool for our enemy and allows Satan to begin the work in the womb. I came out of a generational family of spiritualism. It was a battle, Rick. Rick, it was a battle, even after I came to the Lord. And then they, they said they didn't want me anymore. They wanted my children. They wanted to keep them in the bloodline. And I said, better a millstone be put around your neck and dropped to the depths of the sea before you do this to one of God's little ones. I had to rebuke my parents. God forbid. But this is the world we live in. The devil either takes control of the men or God takes control of the minds of men. Oh, the battery's wearing down. Exodus 34, 7 says, Keeping mercies for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, that they will be by no means clear, the guilty, 
visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. So there are realms in which we work in. I mentioned this the other night as we were talking about this. Kingdoms and dominions. There are three realms which we work in, us humans. There's the physical realm, there's the mental realm, and then there's a spiritual realm that's going on around us, right? A third of the host is down here that are after us. And God's angels are, are trying to protect us from this great controversy that's taking place. The physical realm is what we would call the real world. It is the space and things around us governed by laws. The laws of what? Gravity, friction, velocity. Anything which is a part of our five senses is in this realm as well. You said so, you want to say something, Rick? Oh, I saw your hand up. Okay. Here we see uh, those five senses. Taste, touch, sight, smell, hearing. Testimonies of Church, Volume 3 states, All should guard the senses, lest Satan gain control over them, for these are the avenues to the soul. What you eat. We got a health message, don't we? Did you put on your armor of God this morning? Is your head covered with a helmet of salvation? Are your thoughts covered? Because we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna talk about another set of senses that he's got access to as well. The mental realm is usually referred to as the mind. In the Bible, it consists of everything that goes on in the mind, of which is part of the mind. This includes thoughts, emotions, feelings, decisions, and the human will. This is also called the soul by many people. Here we come from the pen of inspiration. It says, we cannot always be upon our knees in prayer, but we can let the heart be ascending to God continually for his blessing. And he and we will have help just as sure as we keep in the state of mind. The evil angels may be all around you to press their darkness upon you, but the will of God is greater than their power. Amen? And if you do not, in word or action or in any other way, make Christ ashamed of you, the sweet blessing and peace of God will be in your heart every day you live. May the sweet blessing and peace of Christ rest upon us here as we assemble from morning to morning so that we can serve him. We must meet difficulties in order to meet and overcome them. We must have Jesus with us. Satan will say to you that you are a very great sinner and that you need not pray for Jesus will not hear you. Review and Herald, we read on, it says, but you can tell him that because you are a sinner in this very reason why you need to pray, for Christ came to save sinners. And he died upon Calvary's cross in order that sinners might come to him and be saved. Build a wall of scripture around you and you will see that the world cannot break it down. Commit the scripture to memory. And then throw right back upon Satan when he comes with his temptations. It is written. This is the way the Lord met with temptations of Satan and resisted them. Be determined that you will not live without the presence of light and love of Jesus and then you will have precious victories and will know who is the source of your strength. Amen? And then there is the spiritual realm. It's often called the heart in the Bible. The Apostle Paul calls it the things which are not seen. Biblical heart, soul, and mind, the part of us that comes and connects us to the spiritual realm. Matthew, Mark, Luke, what is the greatest commandment? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Jesus in Matthew 22, verse 37, 38, said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Amen? And if our eyes are full of his light, Each realm is governed by laws. The physical realm has laws, some of which we are acquainted with, like gravity. These laws operate all the time, whether we understand them or think about them. So does the laws of mental and spiritual realms. The sciences are providing understandings of these mental laws. So there are laws in the spiritual realm that operate all the time, whether or not we want them to. In the spiritual realm, there's all, 
is either a blessing or a curse. Remember our earlier definition, permission for God to work in your life or permission for Satan to take control. 2 Corinthians 4 through 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Come on. Mm. Unless you know whose mind's in yours. Don't believe everything you think. Ooh, what's that? Doctor in the house, don't we? What was on his head? An EEG. It's a non-invasive test that records electrical patterns of the brain. The test is used to help diagnose conditions such as seizures, epilepsy, head injuries, dizziness, headaches, brain tumors, and sleeping problems. It can all be used to confirm brain death as well. Has anybody ever had an EEG done? No. Well, Anne, we, we, we may reconsider that later, okay? So these are the five brain waves. So we had five senses. Now we've got five brain waves as well. These are active in the brain. And we're going to look at these a little bit. They work on different frequencies. Okay? The delta, the theta, the alpha, the beta, and the gamma. And we're going to look at a little depth of these. So the delta present during dreamless sleep hormones such as Prolactin and human growth hormones are released in the deepest phase of sleep. Theta, present during REM, rapid eye movement sleep, or the dreaming sleep, increased production of catecholamines, vital for learning and memory, increased creativity, deep meditation, hypnotic imagery, emotional experiences, potential charge and behavior in trance, allows access to the unconscious mind. That's what I used to spend a lot of time in when I was into kundalini yoga was the idea of accessing the unconscious mind. The alpha is the pre-sleep, the pre-waking drowsiness, meditation associated with relaxation, super learning, relaxed focus and well-being, super learning, light trance, and increased serotonin production beginning of access to the unconscious mind. And then the beta, which we should all hopefully be in the beta state, all of us here now, it was with alertness, concentration, higher learning, higher levels associated with anxiety, fear, and stress. And then gamma, and I'm sure some of you have experienced gamma associated with alertness, concentration, higher learning, higher levels associated with anxiety, fear, and stress. So you're in a car accident and things seem to slow down. The mind has actually gone into the gamma phase because it's ready for trauma and it's ready to deal with that trauma. So all of these waves are operating where? In our mind. The theta wave is open all the time. All the time. And the devil knows how to ride it. And he uses music. He was a chief musician and he knows what he's doing down here. Syncopate a beat, put you into a, an altered state, Drug use, alcohol use, hypnosis, yoga. These put you into altered states. And then he can come riding in on that way. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Hear, O Rizu, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by thy way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for the sign upon thy hand, and there shall be a frontlets between the eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house, and on thy gates. What is he talking about? Right here. The prefrontal cortex. Guard everything that's coming in. That's why you walk into Walmart and they're, they're pumping music through. Next thing you know, that music gets in your head. You ever notice that? Oh, I remember that song growing up. Yeah. And then next thing you know, you kind of do... Ba, ba, da, 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 da. Boom. Gotcha. That's why neuro-linguistic programming was introduced into churches. 
Then it was taught in our seminaries. And then the, the evangelical music, you know, to get you all worked up. So that when the sermon came, your super subconscious mind was open to whatever they were going to teach. I've seen NLP at work. Come on. But there's a little teeny place inside the brain. Does anybody know what we're looking at? This highlighted piece in the brain? Very close, which is a part of it. it the pineal is a part of it. It's a hypothalamus. Yeah. Yeah, hypothalamus. You're very good, though, science teacher. The hypothalamus is located on the undersurface of the brain. It lies below the thalamus and above the pituitary gland to which it is attached by a stalk. And it's an extremely complex part of the brain containing many regions with highly specialized functions. In humans, the hypothalamus is probably the size of a pea and accounts for less than 1% of the weight of the brain. But it is the, how do you want to say, it's the conduit. We're going to look at this where everything works. So here's, here's an expanded view of what it is. So the, the color area is the hypothalamus. Complex, size of a pea. One of the major functions of the hypothalamus is to maintain homeostasis, i.e. to keep the human body in a stable, constant condition. The hypothalamus responds to a variety of signals from the internal, external environment, including body temperature, hunger, feelings of being full up after eating, blood pressure, and levels of hormones in the circulation. It also responds to stress and controls our daily bodily rhythms, such as the nighttime secretion of melatonin from the pineal gland and the changes of cortisol, the stress hormone, and body temperature over a 24-hour period. The hypothalamus collects and combines this information, puts changes in place to correct imbalances. So it's a, without it, we would cease to exist. I would contend, right? Wow. Here we see how the hypothalamus through the pituitary system talks the rest of the body. By beholding you become changed at the cell level. There's communication that takes place. When the glands have been communicated to you, when they receive the information, they take that, they secrete something, it goes throughout the body, and it synthesizes to our cells. How important is it for us to understand why the devil wants to get inside our DNA by snipping it and introducing some new language? Interesting slice of the brain, right? Now take a look at this, the pineal gland. Oh, we see the golden ratio. Hmm, that's interesting. That's interesting. Let's go a little further. Oh, what's this? It's the eye of Horus. It's the third eye. It's the ability to open up the mind's eye and receive from that other spirit the other gifts that he's willing to give to his children. Now, what are the things that fluoride does to the pineal gland? It calcifies it, so it doesn't work as well. So get rid of your fluoride toothpaste, right? Drink fluorinated water, right? Here we see going back to the ancient Sumerians. They're holding what looks like a pine cone, and that's what the pineal gland looks like. The Anunnaki knew about it. The giants, the sons of Anak. Kusharba. They were given this esoteric knowledge and it came, it's come all the way down. And we see it here, the world's largest pine cone is in the Vatican City State. And we see it on, on the, the different pieces of the staff of the Pope, the staff of Osi Osiris. It's an ancient vision. Five page 225. The visible and the invisible world are in close contact. If the veil be lifted, we would see evil angels employing their arts. Wait, should I use the mic? Uh, I got some of the batteries if you want. 
Okay, we're just going to take a moment here to switch some batteries out because I think this is done. Perfect. Thank you. Testimonies, Volume 5, page 225. The visible and the invisible world are close in contact. Could the veil be lifted? We would see evil angels employing all their arts to deceive and destroy. Wherever an influence is exerted to cause men to forget God, there Satan is exercising his bewitching power. All who venture into scenes of indulgence or irreligious pleasure or seek the society of the sensualist, the skeptic, or the blasphemer by personal intercourse or through the medium of the press, fake news, right? are tempting with sorcery. Error. They are aware. Their mind is bewildered. Their soul is polluted. The apostles' admonition to the Ephesian church should be heeded by the people of God today. Have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. So if there's sin in your presence, by silence we condone it. We don't want to condone it. Matthew 6, 22, 24. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore in the light be single, the whole body may be full of light. But if the eye be evil, then the whole body should be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in the air be darkness, how great is that darkness? For no man can serve two masters, for he either will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. We're coming to a close here. Life Sketches, page 226. Monday evening, I stood in the stand at a tent meeting in progress at Danvers, Mass. A large congregation was before me. I was too weary to arrange my thoughts in connected words. I felt that I must have help, and I asked for it with my whole heart. I knew if any degree of success attended my labors, it would be through the strength of the Mighty One. The Spirit of the Lord rested upon me as that I attempted to speak like a shock of electricity, she said. I felt it upon my heart, and all pain was instantly removed. I had suffered great pain in the nerves centering in the brain. This also was entirely removed. My irritated throat and sore lungs were relieved. My left arm and hand had become nearly useless in consequence of pain in my heart, but natural feeling was now restored. My mind was clear. My soul was full of the light and love of God, angels of God seem to be on every side like a wall of fire. You want that? Yeah. I want it. It's provided to us. We just need to claim it and live a life according to it. Psalm 91, 1, 2. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, and I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God, and Him will I trust. Amen? What's that secret place? Edmund. He's gone. Where is this? Where is this place? It's in the Ark of the Covenant. It's under the, under the gold seed, the Shekinah glory, the mercy seed. He wants us to get in with him. Get in the Ark. Elder Ferziz did a number of sermons on that years ago. Get in the Ark and get other people in the Ark. Signs of the Times, August 5th, 1886. When the earth's history shall close, there will be only two divisions, the righteous and the wicked. Every man, woman, and child will be found in one of these two armies. Jesus will be the leader of the righteous and Satan of the opposing host. The angels who kept not their first estate but left their own habitation are rebels against the law of God and enemies to all who love and obey his commandments. And all who are breaking and teaching others to break the law of God, the foundation of his government in heaven and on earth, are cooperating with these fallen angels in their work and are marshaled under the same chief who directs their operations in opposition to the government of God. These will seek to strengthen their forces by gathering as many people into their ranks and they will annoy and harass and falsify and misrepresent all whom they cannot influence to join them in their work. So be prepared, right? Getting a taste of it now. The cult of Ellen White. 
the Sabbatarian message, right? We're seeing that from the outside world. But they also speak truth. That if you want to be a fundamental Christian, you've got to become a Seventh-day Adventist. The people of the book. That's what we're known as. To the Roman church. Time's up. Almost. This is it. Now is God's time. And his time is your time. Fight the good fight of faith. Refusing to think or talk unbelief. The world is to hear the last warning message. Are we ready? I'm going to close right here. Brothers and sisters, we've got a duty, a sacred trust. That's what the pen of inspiration said. What banner are we standing under? What thought processes are we going through? If it's your desire to be numbered as one of his, please stand up with me. I'll be close and pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, holy, 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 Thou art. Father, it is our desire that we would stand under the banner of Prince Emmanuel to oppose these forces of darkness, Lord. You have given us Your precious promises. You have given us Your word of inspiration that tells us that You're not going to leave any of us in darkness, nor left alone on the battlefield. Father, as we grow in your grace, we grow in your mercy and your love towards others, help us to clean sin out of our lives. Lord, help us to see the, the end of all things. For this is our desire to be with you eternal through Christ Jesus, our hope and our Redeemer. We pray all this in his name. Amen.